Good morning. What an amazing time of worship, but what an amazing day to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me and two of my daughters uh, with you this morning. Uh, we greatly appreciate the opportunity. Um, we, uh, uh, it's always an honor to dig into the Word of God with fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, if you would open your Bibles, if you have them, to the, chap uh, the book of John, uh, we're going to be in chapter 15, verses 4 through 11. Uh, it's a passage that most of us have heard numerous times, uh, probably studied numerous times, but it's a, it's a passage that I think all of us can hear time and time again because of how important this passage is. Uh, before we get, or while you guys are looking there, I want to set the context for what's going on with Jesus and his disciples. So Jesus and his disciples are, are in the upper room right now. Uh, Jesus has just revealed Judas as the betrayer, uh, and it's an emotional time for him. He knows what's right around the corner. He knows that these are some of the last conversations he's going to have with his disciples uh, before he's arrested, before he is, is crucified. Uh, so he's, he is giving the disciples a very important message. Uh, and so that's, that's where we're at uh, with his 11 remaining disciples in the upper room. Uh, before we read the text, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just praise you, Lord, so much for your, uh, just your grace, your mercy. Father, we praise you for giving us your word so that we may know how to live, we may know how to know you. Uh, Lord, I pray that this morning uh, only your truth will come out of my mouth, Father, that, that we will not vary or veer from the text, uh, Lord, but that your truth will be taught uh, in that and that alone. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, I'm going to read the scripture, and then I'm going to share an illustration with you guys. So starting in verse 4 in John chapter 15. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Uh, so I want to share a story. Uh, and this story is when God actually laid this passage on my heart. Uh, my family and I, we live in Brunswick and we live in a neighborhood that has a lot of trees, a lot of natural areas. Uh, and down in the south, you know, we know that in those kind of scenarios, we also have a lot of deer. You know, they're, they're so cute and cuddly when you look at them, but they wreak havoc on your landscaping. I mean, they, they go to town, they think everything belongs to them. Uh, so we've struggled with that the past couple of years, but my wife and I decided we wanted to plant something new this year. We wanted to plant some blueberries, because everybody loves blueberries, right? But, but we didn't want to share those blueberries with the deer. So we, we plant the blueberries, and we go to Home Depot, and we buy a bunch of mesh fencing, because we're, we're going to protect our blueberries. So we get that, we get some zip ties, because I can't think of any other way to make mesh fencing stay together. And so we create these really ugly fences around our blueberry bushes. And, and I'm just thankful that it's in our backyard so my neighbors couldn't see these things, because they were not pretty, but they served the purpose. Uh, so. The other, uh, a few weeks ago, I was cutting the grass at my house, and as I got to the backyard, towards where these blueberry bushes were, I noticed that there was a large, bright, vibrant green weed growing on my mesh fence. And this thing was huge. I mean, the, the fence is probably three to four feet tall, and this thing was almost at the top. It sprouted branches, big leaves. I mean, it was thriving. Well, I didn't want to share the blueberries with the deer. I definitely don't want to share it with the weeds, right? So I do what any responsible gardener would do, and I just clip the root or the, the base of the vine to separate it from the root. 
And that's, what, that, that's when God laid this passage on my heart. Because this passage is such an awesome analogy, that is such a beautiful picture that Jesus paints, where it's so easy for us to see how our relationship with Jesus is supposed to look. And that we brought that back to my mind. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so we're going to get into this verse. We're going to start in verses 4 and 5. And the first thing I want us to do is notice the word abide. This word is used a lot in this passage. John uses it in some of his other books as well. Uh, but that word abide, if we go to the Greek, it's from the root word meno. And that word means to remain, to stay, to reside, to be united with him in our mind, in our heart, and in our will. Uh, it means that we must remain in Christ, which brings us to our first point. Uh, we must abide in Christ in order to have life. You see, in these first two verses, in verses 4 and 5, Jesus tells us that apart from Him, we can do nothing. Apart from Him, if we're not remaining in Him, if we're not united with our mind, with our will, with our spirit, if we're not in tune with God, then we can do nothing. It doesn't matter how great plans we can make. It doesn't matter what, what beautiful activities we can set up through our church or through our own personal life. If we're not letting God go before us, if we're not taking Christ with us, then we can't do anything. We can't do anything apart from Him. That's why it says in Colossians 2, chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So some of us might be thinking, well, I want to walk with God. I want to bear fruit like he talks about in verses 4, uh, where the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. But how do I do that? How do I bear fruit? How do I abide in Christ? Well, we look down in verse 10, where it says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. In 1 John 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 24, he says something similar. He says, As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So what are these verses telling us? How do we abide in Jesus Christ? We abide by keeping His commandments. We abide by clinging to that which we heard first. And what do we hear first? We heard the gospel. We heard the story of how Jesus came to die for us. We heard the story of how he wants to save us from our sin problem. And that's the only way we can be saved, is through Jesus' gospel. That's what we are to cling to. We're to cling to what Jesus tells us in this beautiful book that he provided for us, so that we know how to live for him. That's how we abide in Christ. And we have to be consistent. When we go back to our definition of abide, it doesn't say we must, we must be consistent for a little while. We must remain when it's convenient for us. No, it says we must remain. We must be constant. We must be united in our mind and in our heart and in our will. We have to be concerned with the things of God, not just on Sundays, but every day. We have to be concerned with the things of God, not just when it's convenient for us, when we desperately need help, but we have to be concerned with the things of God when we're happy, when our life is seemingly going perfect. We must always be concerned with the things of God. That is how we abide in Christ. It's a lifetime commitment to our relationship with Him. It's something that we must seek after every single day. That's what Jesus is talking about here when he's talking about abiding in the vine. Being part of the vine is something that requires a commitment. Does that mean that we'll never mess up? Does that mean that we'll never have moments where, where we're maybe not as passionate for Christ as we were a week ago or a month ago? No. Because all of us are sinners. All of us still wrestle with our sinful nature. So all of us will make mistakes. But Jesus is wanting us to realize what it should look like, what our goals should be. They should be up here. We should strive for excellence in our relationship with Christ. We shouldn't settle for mediocrity. We have to aim high. And that's what Jesus wants us to focus on by telling us this passage. In the second half of verse 10, Jesus uses himself as an example. He says... Uh, I Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Well, what does that mean? When Jesus was here on earth, He did everything 
Because of the Father's will. He was acting out the Father's will. Every step he took, every message he spoke, every sacrifice he made, even up to the cross, he did because his Father wanted him to. He did because that was the Father's will. And because of that, because he obeyed his Father's commands, he was resting in the love of his Father, resting in the love of God. And that's the example that he wants us to do. We must remain in his commandments. We must live this book that we read. That's how we abide in Christ. Well, we may wonder, how do I know if I'm abiding in Christ? How, how do I know if I'm doing the right thing? Well, Jesus tells us back in these first two verses that we looked at uh, that, that we will bear fruit. Well, what fruit? What fruit could he be talking about? If we go into the book of Galatians, Chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Again, this is a passage I'm sure all of us have heard multiple times. Uh, but it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are the fruits that we will bear if we are part of the vine. Notice it doesn't say that there's measurements on how many people we, we witness to, that we have to set these marks where I have to witness to 30 people a day, or I have to plan grand activities for my church to, be a, to, to set times to minister. That's not what it says. Now, those things are important. Don't get me wrong. We're commanded to share our faith, but that's not where our focus should be. Our focus should be abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ, because when we do that, all of these other things will happen as a result of the overflow of God in our lives. All of those other things will happen automatically. You see, sometimes as churches, uh, and this is all churches, we get so focused in trying to create opportunities and trying to set Certain times, well, we're going to show up to minister to our neighborhood on this day. We're going to show up to, to evangelize the school close to us on this day. We, we spend so much time planning these activities that the, the simple fact of abiding in Christ escapes our notice. We, we spend so much time focusing on planned ministry events that we forget about just abiding in Christ abiding in the God that wants to spend time with us. You see, our focus should be on meditating with God every day, every night, spending time with Him in prayer every single day. That's how we abide. That's how we remain. That's how we do effective ministry. It's not setting up numerous activities. It's abiding in Christ. You see, when we get to that point, when our focus is on Christ, that's when change starts to happen. That's when ministry starts to happen because we're no longer looking at the world through our eyes. We're looking at the world through the eyes of God. We're seeing what He wants us to see. We're seeing the opportunities that He has for us that normally we wouldn't see because we're so focused on our activities. That's what Jesus is talking about. He wants us to remain in Him, to be constant with Him. You know, these fruits that he's talking about, let, you know, let's be honest. The fruits of the Spirit, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we can't do those things by ourselves. We can't show love and we can't live out peace and patience on our own merit because we love ourselves too much. The love of ourself gets in the way of us loving others because we would always want to put ourselves first. We, we're quick-tempered. We're short-fused. All of these things are the way we are as, as a sinful nature in our hearts. We can't have these fruits unless we remain in the vine. We can't have these fruits unless we are seeking after Christ. The vine, or the weed that I mentioned in the first part of my story, you know, when it was thriving, it was vibrant and green, and it was growing because it was connected to its roots. It had that life source of energy and of growth. But as soon as that weed, that weed was severed from the roots, it was done. It had lost it. It had lost its energy. And for us to remain in Christ, for us to abide in Christ, that's what separates a believer from an unbeliever. It's the fact that we remain in Christ. 
That brings us to our next point. If we do not abide in Christ, we will not have eternal life. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. You see, Jesus doesn't, he doesn't have a gray area. In this passage, there are two camps we can belong in. We can either abide in Christ, or we don't abide in Christ. And if we don't abide in Christ, then we will not have eternal life. And we may say, well, who is he talking about in this passage? It's easy for us to identify that he's talking about unbelievers. He's talking about people who either haven't heard the gospel yet or who have heard the gospel and have chosen to rebel against God. Those are easy to identify. But what about the other group? What about the group that shows up at church every Sunday all across our country, that shows up on church every Sunday night and may even teach? but have never encountered Christ in their heart. And you may think, well, that, that can't happen. You know, how can they hear messages Sunday after Sunday and not come to a relationship with God? All we have to do is look at Judas. Judas was with the Son of God himself every day while Jesus was doing his ministry. He saw the miracles. He saw the compassion that Jesus had for others. He saw Lazarus, Lazarus being raised from the dead. He saw the feeding of the 5,000. He saw all of these things with his own eyes. And yet he still did not believe. He still, knowing all of that, he still betrayed our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. So if Judas could be exposed to the Son of God himself and still not believe, then it's very possible for people to be in our churches today and not believe. It's very possible for people to, to appear that they are Christian, but they're not. You know, it's, it's easy uh, for people to put on appearances on Sundays, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, Maybe get church get-togethers, but then live the rest of their life any way they see fit. And Jesus is telling us in black and white, according to this passage, that that's not the way it should be. He says we either abide in Christ or we don't. You may have heard stories about people who have appeared to live for God most of their life until one day, seemingly out of the blue, they recant their faith and they start making Crazy life decisions. You may have heard about a prominent example here in the past couple of weeks about a teacher who is known for, he started decades ago, who stepped away from the faith. And this passage, what this passage tells us is, is that those people did not lose their salvation. Because we believe that if, if we are part of God's family, if we are in the hand of God, then nothing can separate us from God. But what that passage, what this passage tells us is that those people were never part of the vine. They were never part of a vine, and we know that because they didn't abide. They didn't remain in the vine. That's what sets the believer apart. If the believer will abide in Christ no matter what temptations come our way, no matter what trials come our way, no matter what life throws at us, we will remain. We may lose our passion briefly. We may take a step back briefly. We may mess up even. But we will remain in Christ. That's what makes us believers and separates us from the unbeliever. That's the key. We may get tired as believers. We may get overwhelmed. We may feel like we're beaten down sometimes. But we'll never walk away. Because we want to abide in Christ. We want to stay connected to that life flow. And here is where it gets good, church, because we are about to get into the promises to, that awaits those that abide in Christ. I mean, how many of us enjoy reading promises that God makes to us in His Word? Because we can believe those. Because God cannot tell a lie. So we know if He tells us something in His Word, we can trust it. Right? We can believe it. And that's what we're going to get into. The promised benefits of abiding in Christ are many. 
You guys ready to hear some good news this morning? All right, let's get into it. So let's look at the promises made to those who remain in Christ. And we're going to start right off the bat in verses 4 and 5, where he says, Abide in me, and I in you. So right off the bat in this passage, Jesus tells us if we abide in him, then guess what? He is going to abide in us. I mean, we could stop there and say amen and hallelujah, right? Because God is with us all the time if we're believers. All the time. We're never alone. No matter where we go, no matter what we're dealing with, God is with us. But God in His grace and His mercy, He doesn't stop there. He's just warming up, right? So if we continue down this passage, we look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now I want us to make sure we understand this correctly, church, because I don't want you guys to leave here and think, well, that guy said if I pray for a new house, God's going to give it to me, right? Or if I pray for a new car, God's going to give it to me. That's not what God is saying. That's not what Jesus is saying here, okay? So what he is saying, let's look at this verse again. He's saying, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. So what does that mean? That means if we are living this book, if we are demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit, if we are seeking out God every single day, then what's going to happen to us? Our will is going to be transformed from thinking about us to thinking about God. Our will is going to be transformed from being distracted by things of the world to being focused on things of God. And when that happens, when we start seeing the world through the eyes of God, then what we pray for is going to be what God wants to do. Because our focus becomes not on the temporary things, but on the eternal things. And that's what Jesus says. If we pray for stuff for the kingdom's sake, then those prayers will be answered. And how amazing of a promise to know that when we lift up our prayers to God, He'll not only hear them, but He will answer them. I mean, that's a promise that we can trust that the God who created us, the God who created the world, is there listening, waiting to request or waiting to answer our prayers. But again, He doesn't stop there. I mean, this is amazing. Let's let's go to verse 8. Same passage. Verse 8 says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So we will bring glory to God. What greater purpose do we have than to bring glory to God? Nothing. That's the whole reason we're here on this earth, is to point our, God's glory back to Him through our life, through our praise of Him. That's why we are here. That's why we are here. And if we bear fruit and we prove to be his disciples, then we will glorify his name. And we've talked about bearing fruit. We've talked about what that looks like. We've talked about the fact that our lives will demonstrate that we are his because of the way we live. People will know us by our fruit. They'll know us by the way we treat others. They'll know us by the way we worship God. They'll know us by the way we live our life. Because our lives... Well, well, they'll see the focus in our life. They'll see the fact that, that we're not focused on activities, but we're focused on Christ. And all of those other things that churches and Christians should do, like evangelizing and like ministering to the, the people who need our help, like showing love to the unloved, all of those things are going to happen when we focus on God. The next promise we're going to look at actually isn't in this passage, but John is still referring to the people who abide in Christ. And the next promise comes out of the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 28, where he says, Now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. What an amazing promise. Everybody in this world, we are told in the Bible that we are all appointed to die once and then face judgment. That is an eternal fact that all of us have to deal with. And for people who don't know God, when that day comes, there's going to be fear and trembling. But to the believer, to the one who remains in Christ, we can have confidence that we have nothing to fear. 
Because we know what awaits us when we leave this earth. It's something far greater than what this world can offer. We have no reason to fear. We have no reason to be scared. Because we know no matter what this world offers us, no matter how much sorrow, no matter how much pain, no matter how much grief, we know that heaven is greater. We know that our eternity is greater than what we have on this earth. So we have no reason to be afraid. That's a promise to those who remain in Christ. There's one more promise, and this, this personally speaking, is, is probably my favorite in this passage. And that comes in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. And just let that sink in for a minute. You know, we live in a society, we live in a world that is fixated on pleasure, fixated on satisfaction, on instant gratification. We're fixated on our happiness and trying to find that happiness in material things, temporary things. You look at social media, it's all about people trying to achieve happiness through a number of likes or through a new car or a new house or whatever the case may be. People are trying to find happiness. If I can only have a new job, if I can only get a bigger house, if I can only get a car that doesn't break down on me all the time, then I would be happy. But that's not what this is saying. This passage is telling us that we won't find our full joy in the world because it doesn't exist in the world. It is temporary. The world offers nothing of eternal value. This passage tells us that we will find our joy to be full in Christ and in Christ alone. We will find our full joy if we are abiding and remaining in Christ. That's the only time we'll have full joy. And I don't know about you guys, but I mean, wouldn't we like our joy to be full? I mean, can you imagine going through life and being so full of joy that nothing can steal that joy. Nothing can steal the source of our joy because it's rooted in our relationship with Christ. It's not tied to our job. It's not tied to our house or to our boyfriend or to our girlfriend. It is tied to our faith in God. And nobody can take that away. That's the kind of joy that Jesus promises to us right here in this text. And it's ours for the taking if we remain in Christ. If we abide in Christ. You know, when I, when I clipped that weed that was around my mesh fence, uh, it wasn't the only one, but it was the closest. So I showed mercy to the ones that were farther away, but I clipped that one, because that one was getting a little too close to my blueberry bush. Uh, but the one after I clipped it, you know, it had entwined itself around the mesh fence, so it was still there. It was dead. And it was withered, but it was still there. That had live weeds around it. You see, if we're here this morning, and, and we're not, we're, we're, or if we're here this morning and we're confident that we are abiding in Christ, that we're remaining in Christ, then I want to encourage you to persevere in that. I want to encourage you to continue to run that race, like Paul says in Romans, like we're in it to win it. That we're in it to seek the prize of eternal life with God in heaven. Where we will be surrounded by His presence for eternity. But, if you're not here, or I'm sorry, if you're here, but you're not sure that you're abiding in Christ. If you're here and you haven't experienced these promises, if you're here and, and you're struggling with the fact that maybe you're one way on a Sunday and you're a totally different person when you walk out of the back of that church, maybe you're, you're struggling with, you, if you, you're wondering if you've ever even accepted Christ in your life. Well, I know one way to set you on the right path. Because if you're here this morning and you're not sure of your salvation, if you ask yourself this question, if you say, if you ask yourself, am I living the same today as I did before I say I came to know Christ? Then there's a good chance that you have not met Christ. 
Because the Bible tells us that when we encounter Christ, we will go from having a heart of stone to having a heart of flesh. We'll go from being controlled by our sinful nature to being under dominion of sin to being set free from that bondage of sin. There will be a radical change in our lives, in our outlook, in our focus. There should be a difference when we encounter Christ. We cannot be the same. There has to be a change in our life. And if you have not experienced that change, then I encourage you to not leave this place until you talk to somebody. Our lives are too short. Our, our flesh is too weak to put that decision off. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We can't operate in the mindset of, well, I want to live for me a little bit longer before I give my life to God. I'll give my life to God next year when I'm done getting everything out of my system. But we're not guaranteed next year. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And, and what about these promises that are awaiting us when we remain and abide in Christ? That's greater than anything this world has to offer anyway. So what are we waiting for? If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, if you're here this morning and you're not sure you are remaining, you're abiding in Christ, maybe you are the ones that he's talking to in verse 6, then don't leave this place without becoming sure. Don't leave this place without finding out how you can remain in Christ, coming how you can know Christ. It's not too late. As long as you have breath in your lungs, it is not too late, church. We're going to close with a passage out of the book of Psalm, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Let's be that person, church. Let's be the ones who meditate on the law of God every day, every night. Let's be like a tree. Notice, that we're not talking about a little weed. We're talking about a tree where our faith is so rooted in God that we're not going anywhere. We are rooted by the living water. Our fruit is plentiful and our leaf does not wither. Let's be that person, church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, God. We, we love the fact that, that you want a relationship with us. We love the fact that, that you are so full of grace and mercy that you... You forgive us of our sins. Lord, we love the fact that you provide us so many promises, so many words of wisdom in your text, Lord. We thank you that you were merciful. We're, we thank you that you have patience with us when we mess up. But, but Father, we pray that you would give us all of the courage, all of the, the steadfastness to remain in you, Lord. No matter what this world throws at us, we pray that we would remain. No matter how hard it gets, we pray that we would remain. And Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who does not know you, Father, I pray that you would pull on their heart so strongly that, God, they couldn't leave this place without talking to you. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace. In Jesus' name.